You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. So today we're going to have a little bit of fun. Kind of just thought about this, and I thought it would be kind of cool to look at, and alas, it was pretty cool. So I might as well share what I found out. What I want to do is I want to look back at um, the entirety of the PFF era and look at the best and worst contributors for the Green Bay Packers of all time. Kind of just, uh, that last episode we did kind of got me curious. You know, I was kind of surprised, to be honest, that 2014 was the highest graded overall team, according to PFF, and I kind of didn't want to stop there. So I want to start with, um, and you know, it's not a super big deep dive. I don't don't want this to be overly cerebral. If we're low on, or you know, if, if this is going a little too quickly and we need to slow it down, maybe we'll start looking at a few stats. But I want this to be kind of a, a light one for this Saturday. So as always, uh, the one final thing I'd like to remind you of, the only thing I'd like to remind you of today, iTunes reviews. Five more gets us to 200 five-star iTunes reviews. After that, I don't care. I'm tired of kicking and screaming and dragging. And you're tired of hearing me do it. So let's get five more. I'm going to give away a Pro Football Focus subscription so you can kind of play well. Actually, you can't do this because it's not an elite subscription, but it's still a subscription and it's a free thing and you should enjoy that. Otherwise, if there's anything else you'd like to know, be sure to check the uh, description of the show. There is a link of links as well as a phone number where you can text and call if you'd like to send in a question. Otherwise, let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to start with special teams because I want to go from least interesting to most interesting. Be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place and you can get the app and try it out for yourself so go ahead and test drive u.s cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days that's u.s cellular built for us terms apply awards based on open signal independent data so go to uscellular.com for all the details So special teams doesn't go back quite as far. I think it goes to about 2012, 2013, somewhere in there. There also is not, it's it's not very common. Maybe for some teams it is, but from what I've seen looking at other teams' special teams units, very rarely are there good players, right? At least as far as their grading goes, it's hard to get a good grade on special teams. Usually there will be maybe one if a team is pretty solid. Like I think I look back at Miami um, back when our... our, uh, What's his name? Rizzy was there. I think they had like two, something like that, two or three. But looking at special teams, there are three components. There's the kicking, there's the returning, and then there's all the other stuff, the blocking and tackling. So looking at blocking and tackling, from 2013 to 2018, there are four 
total contributors that had a grade of 80 or higher. 80, according to Pro Football Focus, is very good. There weren't any elites, but there was one guy that was pretty close. So in fourth place, the fourth highest overall grade ever was Don Barclay in 2015. Primarily what he did was he was on the field goal unit. He had a grade of 81.1. Just a little ahead of that at 81.6 was a guy that I really, really liked that did not quite pan out, had a pretty good rookie season. But anyways, Mr. Quentin Rollins in 2017 had the third highest ever special teams grade. He did a few different things, but primarily his, his what he spent most of his snaps on was kick coverage. A little bit of a jump, and this shouldn't surprise you. Part of the fun, by the way, is to be to maybe maybe pause it before we get going to try to think who it might be. This guy was known as a special teamer. If I was listening to this podcast, it wouldn't come to me, but as soon as I say it, I'd be like, oh yeah, of course. He did absolutely everything. Jack of all trades. If you look at his snap count, let me just look real quick, in 2014, that'll give you a hint. 72 snaps uh, for kick return, 109 for kick coverage, 67 for punt return, 54 for punt coverage, 55 on the punt block unit, or the field goal block unit. The only thing he didn't do was field goal kick, but he had 357 snaps on special teams, second only to Sean Richardson, who had 358. So basically every single special team snap that there was. Um, by the way, this was actually a really good year, 2014. There are um, good or higher. You got Brad Jones, Dayton Jones, Casey Hayward, Tremont Williams, and J. Ron Elliott all had 70s or higher. However, the second highest ever grade is Mr. Jarrett Bush. He had 13 tackles, three missed tackles, and one penalty on the season. Most tackles of anybody um, in 2014. And then finally, and a little bit surprising, and it's kind of a small uh, sample size, I tried to keep the snaps uh, to a certain level, but I thought it was impressive enough that I wanted to add it, and it wasn't such a small number that it was irrelevant. Actually, it's not a very small number at all. It, I, <laughs> he had 84 snaps just on field goal block, which was his primary thing, 111 total snaps, but it was Mr. Dayton Jones who actually was, you know, as I mentioned in 2014, was pretty high too. I don't know if he, either I wasn't paying attention or he didn't get enough credit, but Dayton Jones was kind of killing it on special teams. Honorable mention, and the only reason he's not here, and I think Devontae also had a pretty high grade one year, but it's very small sample size. Um, in 2013, six total snaps on special teams. All six were uh, kick return, but with an 88.2 overall grade. Mr. Jordy Nelson, little little, little tidbit for you. Looking at kicking, um, only three, all three obviously were Mason Crosby, zero punters have ever had a good grade. In fact, I think they're all pretty terrible. (laughs) Um, And no grade has been in the 80s. All three of these grades are in the 70s, and Crosby has not been in this since 2016, which was his lowest of the three. Um, In 2016, he had a grade of 70.1, just barely getting into the good category. And this, by the way, is his field goal. So so the way that they break it down, they have field goals, kickoffs, and punting. Um, none of the kickoffs or punting. So all three of these grades are Mason Crosby's field goal attempts. This year, and I think extra points count too, he was 54 of 57, so 94.7% on extra points. He was 1 for 1 inside of 19 yards. He was 6 for 6 in inside of, uh, you know, from 20 to 29 yards. 14 of 16 from 30 to 39 5 of 7 from 40 to 49, and 3 of 4 from 50 or more yards. He was 54, or excuse me, 29 of 34, 85.3% uh, field goal completion. So pretty good. Missing 2 in the 30-yard range isn't fantastic, but, you know, whatever. The next highest grade was the year prior. In 2015, Mason Crosby had a grade of 75.5. He was 41 of 41. He hit every single extra point, 100%. He was 1-for-1 one one inside of 19 yards, 9-for-9 nine nine, uh, in the 20-yard range, 5-for-5 five five inside of the 30-yard range, 9-of-12, 75% in the 40-yard range, and 4-of-5 from 50 yards out. 28-of-32 overall, didn't miss a single kick under 40 yards. That's pretty good, man. But it was not his best year. His highest graded year was actually in 2013 where he had a grade of 76.2. He was 44 of 44 extra points, 1 for 1 inside of uh, under 20, 15 of 15 under 30, 8 of 8 in the 30-yard range, 6 of 8 in the 40-yard range, and 5 of 7 in the 50-yard range. Excuse me, 50-plus, but I'm sure it was in the 50s. I don't think he hit any 60s. 
35 of 39, 89.7%, didn't miss a single kick under 40 yards. So it's a little bit discouraging, too, when you look at it because, you know, I want to blame the, the special teams unit or whatever. But if you look at it, 2013 was his best year, then 2015, then 2016, which was his last, you know, I guess good year. 2017, he was graded at 55.2, which is, you know, below average. 33 of 35 for extra points, um, 8 of 8 inside of 20, only 2 of 4, 50% in the 30-yard range, 4 of 4 from uh, 40 yards out, and then 1 of 3 from 50-plus. And then in uh, 2018, 53.7, even a slight dip, again, below average, 34 of 36 for uh, extra points. 4 of 4 inside of 20, 10 of 11 in uh, in the 30-yard range, 11 of 15 in the 40-yard range, 5 of 7 from 50-plus. So hopefully he can rebound a little bit, but you kind of it, it kind of changes my thought process as far as, come on, man, it's Mason Crosby, he's awesome. Obviously, Ficken's not going to take his spot. Nobody's taking his spot. He's going to remain. But you kind of look at it. 2013 was his best year. 2016 was kind of his last good year, and it's been kind of down since then. So I am hoping for a rebound, but you can kind of see it and say the Packers can see the trend and the Packers can see his price tag and the Packers can see his age. And it would not be surprising if they're saying, I don't think it's that serious of a thing because it's just Ficken. Look at what the Bears are doing. They're bringing in like six guys, right? That's a dire, a lot of teams are in dire situations. The Packers are not one of them, but it kind of just changed my perspective enough to where I'm looking at it and going, eh, this could be real. Like, we might actually be looking to actually want to replace him. Because he's, he's 27 and 20, 2017 and 2018 are not worth his price tag. Bottom line, right? I mean, if you're kicking like you were in 2016, I'll pay the $5 million bucks. I'm not paying $5 million for, you know, 94% on extra points and 81% on field goals. Just not, not really doing that. But then um, finally, for special teams looking at returns, there are five grades since 2013 that are 70s and 80s, so 70s up. And this is uh, for kick return as well as punt return. Um, the fifth best ever is Trevor Davis's kick return ability in 2017. He had a grade of 72.5, 31 total returns for 707 yards. His longest was a 34-yard return. Yards per attempt, 22.8. That's pretty good. Now, the funny thing about it is, and I've mentioned this before, if your average is 22.8, as good as that is, when they kick it into the end zone, you always take a knee, which is kind of funny because I'm willing to bet the NFL kind of knew what this number was. There's probably several players that are kind of in that 21, 22, 23 yards per return average. So they look at it and say, if we if we keep it at 20, everybody's bringing it out. If we bump it to 25, the numbers don't support it. Nobody's going to bring it out because almost nobody is returning for 25 yards or more per attempt. But either way, it's a good number. You know, if they kick it, you know, between the one and five yard line or something, and you have to return it. You want a guy that's getting 23 yards per return to at least try to get you to that uh, 25 yard line, if not have the potential to kind of break one a little bit. The next high, and by the way, there's three people. So I've already given you one. There's three people. So go ahead and pause it. Take a minute. Who are the three guys? You probably know one of them. The other one might take a little bit of a second, but there's three return guys since 2013 that have positive return grades. One of them just is a good kick returner. Two of them are kick and punt returners. They have high grades for. Take a minute and think about it. All right, time's up. So the second highest uh, return grade was kick returner in 2013, Mr. Micah Hyde, 75.8 overall grade. 30 returns, 531 yards, 70 yards was his longest, only 17.7 yards per attempt. So even that, obviously his breakaway 70 yarder, plus maybe he had a couple of those, I don't know, probably has a big part of why he was as high as he was. But if you look at the yards per attempt, it, you know, Again, as far as trying to glean something from this, it just makes me respect Trevor Davis even more, which we probably should be doing anyways. Not saying we have to all agree that he should be on the team, but at least understand as far as special teamers go, Trevor Davis is kind of unique and there aren't very many like him. The next highest is a bit of a jump out of the 70s from 75.8, uh, which is what Micah Hyde had, all the way up to 81.1 in 2015 kick returner Jeff Janis. Talk about impressive. Check this out. 18 returns, so kind of a small number, but 505 yards. 70 yards was his longest. 28.1 yards per attempt. That man was crazy. 
By the way, Ty Montgomery had an average of 31.1 that year. Only seven attempts, but that's pretty crazy. And his longest was only 46, so it was pretty consistent. But grade wasn't very high, so you lose. The second highest grade ever for the Green Bay Packers is a punt return grade in 2014, and once again, it is Mr. Micah Hyde. He had 17 punt returns for 261 yards, six fair catches, 75 yards was his longest. He had a 15.4 yards per attempt average, which is really high, because you think about it, punt returns, very different than kick returns. You don't get that automatic 15 yards before you even see somebody. You got somebody in your face within a yard. So 15.4 yards per attempt is awesome, but beyond that, the thing that really makes this incredible, two touchdowns from punts that year. So really, really solid. And then finally, and probably not super surprising, um, but the highest ever uh, return grade from any special teamer in, in since 2013 is the punt return grade from Trevor Davis in 2017. So if you think about it, because I've, I've referenced this before, in, in 2018 we heard a lot about Trevor Davis. A lot of the fans wanted him gone, and a lot of the, the coaches like McCarthy were saying, you guys don't understand, he was really good. And then Pro Football Focus started coming out with stuff saying, oh, look how good he is. And you look at it and say, like, oh, that is really good. This is a little bit more context. This is the highest grade any Green Bay Packer has ever had as a returner, and the second highest special teams grade overall of anybody. The only higher grade was Dayton Jones in 2013. And really, this is the last time Trevor Davis has played since, you know, 2018 he was injured. So the last time we got a look at him, he was this good. We're talking 24 returns, 289 yards, 22 fair catches. 65 yards was his longest, 12 yards per attempt. No touchdowns, but still very good. And, and you know, you kind of look at it and say, okay, well, why was it so high if he didn't have any touchdowns as yards per attempt? Again, the, the grade is different than the production. They're two separate things. The grade is watching the film study, right? 12 yards per attempt. Well, how did he get those 12 yards? Did he just run 12 yards and then the first guy that was there tackled him? Or was he doing a lot of cool stuff? Trevor Davis being Trevor Davis, he's the kind of guy that makes stuff happen, right? Oh, look, he's going down. Oh, nope, he's still going. Oh, there he goes, right? He's, he's like Aaron Jones running the ball. Oh, that's not going. Oh, there he goes, right? So anyways, that's it as far as special teams. Um, if you didn't notice, by the way, um, the first one I mentioned was Trevor Davis as a kick returner, 72.5. That was also 2017. So um, in the same year last year, Trevor Davis was simultaneously the number one return grade and the number five overall return grade in the same year, one of them punt return, one of them kick return. And that would be the third highest kick return grade ever, the number one highest punt return grade ever for the Green Bay Packers. So Davis is not just pretty good, he's irreplaceably good. So the question is, in regard to Davis, assuming that this wasn't a fluke, which I don't think it was, do we care that much? D does, does this matter enough that we want to keep him, or are we okay getting rid of him, replacing him with somebody that just can't do it, and and just moving on, because we want somebody else on the roster, and, and in my mind, it really is similar to getting rid of Aaron Jones and, and putting in Jamal Williams, assuming, let's just say, the running back position didn't matter hardly at all. It's like saying we don't really care that much about the run game, we would rather have an extra wide receiver on the roster, whatever, so we're going to get rid of um, Aaron Jones and just let somebody like Jamal take over that spot, right? There's good enough, and then there's special. Marquez doing kick returns is good enough. In other words, he can probably do just about what anybody else in the NFL can do, which is nothing. Trevor Davis is special. That's the question. And again, I don't care how you answer it. I'm just telling you that's, that's the decision we have to make. How important is that returning ability? For me, as I've said, I don't mind designating a spot for it. We have a spot for long snapper, we have a spot for kicker, we have a spot for punter. I wouldn't mind having a spot for return man. And he doesn't have to focus on being a wide receiver. He spends all day long learning how to return kicks and punts, right? Learning how to catch the ball and not muff it. Spend all your time with the special team. I don't care that much because the number six wide receiver just isn't that important in my mind. The guy that plays 52 snaps and doesn't do hardly anything. But again, that's my opinion. I don't mind how you want to answer that. But uh, we're going to take a break, and then I want to run through and look at some of the worst players over the years, and then come back finally with the, uh, I think we're going to go with 30 best players. It actually just worked out that way. I picked a random number of 87, and it comes out to exactly 30 players that have been 87 or higher since, what is it, 2000 and, looks like 2006, I think is the last one. There is actually grades for 1996, 
but it's not a complete season. I think they went back and graded either the Super Bowl that year, which the Packers were obviously in, or maybe it was the playoffs during that time. Nobody had super high grades, so I mean, if you're interested, just ask, and I'll tell you what the grades were. But we're not going to go down that road. So this will be from 2006 on. But anyways, take a break. We'll be right back. All right, so starting in 2006, and this is actually kind of hilarious, we're not going to do special teams because who cares, um, but I just want to look at offense and defense and look at the worst performers starting in 2006 until the current era. And the reason it's funny is because in 2006, the worst player, guy who only played two games, 36 total snaps, take a guess who it was, with a 30.3 overall grade, absolutely horrible, the next lowest was 42, is Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> Aaron Rodgers came in uh, for two games, week four against Philadelphia. He played 11 total snaps, four of them passing, seven of them run blocking, which I don't think he was actually blocking. They were probably just run plays because you got your backup in, so we're mostly just going to hand the ball off. But uh, against Philadelphia, he passed the ball. Let's see. He was two of three for 14 yards, 4.7 yards per attempt, which is a very low number. And then week 11 was against the New England Patriots. He had 17 total dropbacks. He completed 4 of 12, 33.3% for 32 yards, 2.7 yards average. That's real bad, man. On defense that year, uh, the only guy that really stood out was Abdul Hodge, linebacker. Had a grade of 42.1. 2007, looking at the defense... Nobody really down in the 30s, 20s, or anything like that. Had a bunch of guys in the 40s. The lowest was Frank Walker, cornerback. But the lowest grade of anybody with a significant amount of snaps was probably not super surprising, but Jared Bush. Again, I mentioned great special teamer, but not the greatest cornerback on the planet. Um, Flipping over to offense, the guy with the lowest grade and actually a decent amount of snaps. And I'll be honest, I don't know who this is. There's a lot of names I don't remember. Well, a lot of these guys are playing in one game or whatever. But he played in 10 games. His name is Junius Costin. He started the season um, weeks 1 through 5 as a right guard, and then he was gone. Then he came back in weeks 13 through 17 as primarily a right guard and then switched to left guard. I don't know if he was a backup that just came in or what, but um, not a great effort there, Junius. In 2008 on defense, uh, the worst grade of anybody, very, very limited sample size, but half of the fun is mentioning some of these names to see if you remember who they are. I don't remember this person. Linebacker Tracy White. Um, but ridiculously small sample size. Um, the first person that comes in at over 100 snaps was Jeremy Thompson, edge rusher, a grade of 37.2. Um, some other guys with pretty low grades, Desmond Bishop, Kabir Baja, Biamilla, Brady Papinga. I mean, you, you can keep going down the list. There's a lot of names that are just not good this year. Um, A.J. Hawk, Aaron Campman, Ryan Pickett, Patrick Lee, uh, Johnny Jolly, Charlie Pepra, Um, All of them came in under 60, so below average or worse. On offense, the one guy that stood out, again, small sample size, but it's funny to bring it up, was Matt Flynn. So Matt Flynn, very similar to Aaron Rodgers, comes in presumably to replace the starter. He played um, two snaps in Week 2, seven in Week 4, and one snap in Week 12. Overall grade of 32.9. Other than that, the two guys that were... uh, It's actually a pretty good year overall. There's only three players that were under 60 just goes to show how good of a team this was but ryan grant uh 50.5 and deshaun win 51.1 in 2009 on defense the uh, lowest graded player the lowest graded starter we'll say is brady papinga once again 48.7 he was pretty consistently down here on the bottom uh jared bush once again was pretty low um then several people in the 50s bj raji Mike Montgomery keeps popping up. Jarius Wynn, Johnny Jolly, kind of the same guys. Lowest offensive grade, Deshaun Wynn. Uh, The first guy that was, I guess you can call a starter, played in 11 games was Corey Hall, fullback. Matt Flynn, again, had a pretty rough go of it. Donald Lee, uh, the first guy that played in 17 games, basically in all the games, uh, 52.5 overall grade. 2010 on defense. Not exactly a starter at this point, but the worst grade overall was Morgan Burnett. Some other guys under 50, Brandon Chiller, Brad Jones, Robert Francois, and Frank Zombo. Frankie Boy was the only one that had uh, significant playing time, 589 snaps over 14 games. On offense, the guy that stood out as by far the worst was Jason Spitz, the center. He only played in five games, so there might have been some injury issues. Um, Most of the guys that were pretty low... Uh, had limited snaps. Ryan Grant only played in one game. Mark Tauscher only played in four games. The lowest graded player, which wasn't that bad, 56.1, 
was wide receiver Brett Swain, who played in 15 games. 2011, on defense, once again, bottom of the barrel by quite a bit is Mr. Frank Zombo, once again. B.J. Raji, again, down toward... How... Was he ever good? What... Ha- in my mind, he was just always awesome. I know he had, like, low periods, but I feel like he's been down at the bottom every year. Maybe I just have a memory of one play, and that's about it. Let me take a look here really quickly at Mr. B.J. Raji. Oh, that is horrible. Oh! 2009, 52. 2010, his only year in which he was graded as good, 71. Which, by the way, his coverage grade was a 93, so that's going to skew it a bit. But then 44, 62, 47, and 50. He was only average one year. Four out of his six years, he was below average or bad. Huh. That's interesting. Okie dokie. Learn some stuff every day. On offense, the one guy that stands out below 50, played in nine games, 101 snaps, is DJ Williams, tight end. Honorable mentions, Ryan Taylor, tight end. Tom Crabtree, tight end. Packers have had lots of success with tight ends, as you can see. I know it's blasphemy to talk bad about Tom Crabtree, but let's face it, <laughs> he was really awesome in trick plays, and um, usually if he caught a pass, it was a touchdown, so that's cool, but he was never really a super elite tight end. In 2012, once again, the bottom guy, and he was bottom by quite a lot, is uh, Jarrett Bush, 38.1. Three other guys that were under 50, Jarrell Worthy, defensive lineman, Frank Zombo, edge rusher, and Sean Richardson, who was just, oh, oh, do you remember that duo? I don't even remember who it was. Sean Richardson and somebody. But it was it was by far easily the worst safety duo in the NFL. It was laughable how bad it was. I'm sure we'll get there. Anyways, um, and then on offense, once again, he's a backup, but whatever. By far the worst player, Graham Harrell, quarterback. 33.5 overall grade. Several guys in the 50s, uh, Mr. Tim Maste. Please understand this is an offensive grade. Blaine, relax. So he must have come in and, and thrown a pass or something. I don't know. Uh, Grant, Greg Van Roten, Mr. Rotten himself, Johnny Rotten. Then you had Jarrett Boykin, Donald Driver, Jeremy Ross, uh, Mason Crosby. Must have been another trick play. They were going crazy, I guess. And then, yes, once again, Tom Crabtree. My family is descending into chaos, which is great. 2013, um, oh my goodness, <laughs> the defense, oh, there he is, Jerron McMillan, that's who I was thinking of, yes. The worst player this year, and there are a lot of really bad players, two players in the 20s, the worst player this year, Jerron McMillan, 28.3, and then Mr. Robert Francois, linebacker, 28.6, this is my background music. Um, and then there were one, two, three, four, five, six players that were in the 40s, including Dayton Jones, John Kuhn, who kind of doesn't count, Chris Harper, who's a wide receiver, Jake Stoneburner, tight end. So none of these matter. But then B.J. Raji and Nate Palmer. So pretty ugly, especially Jerome McMillan and uh, Robert Francois. And Francois only played 12 snaps. So really, we're just talking about Jerome McMillan being the worst player in the history of the world. Ugh. Oh, that was brutal. And then, hilariously, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, after this year, the Bears picked up Jerron McMillan. <laughs> it was funny because everybody on the planet, outside of even Green Bay, people knew that Jerron McMillan was just a joke. And then the Bears pick him up, and it's like, you guys are just dummies. I mean, even 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 if the plan was, oh, we're going to get him and get all the secrets. To learn. What secrets does Jerron McMillan know? He doesn't know how to play. He doesn't know the defense. What are you doing? What is in your mind right now? Just give me a tour real quick of what's going on in your brain. Bunch of geniuses. Offense much better. Nobody was in the 40s or below. Several people in the 50s. A couple of the highlights. Uh, Ryan Taylor, tight end. Big shocker. Once again, tight ends. Uh, Jonathan Franklin, who uh, actually had a very good pass blocking and a decent receiving grade, but his running grade wasn't super hot. Um, primarily, he was in the in the passing game as a receiver. 30 of his snaps actually came as a receiver out of 62 12 pass blocking, 19 running, and 1 run blocking. So it's, it's really upsetting what happened to Jonathan Franklin. I think that would have been a really awesome duo between him and Eddie Lacy. But um, anyways, um, the only other guy with some significant time that was pretty horrible would have been Marshall Newhouse. Again, not surprising anybody playing tackle. 2014, bottom of the barrel was Mr. Brad Jones. Linebacker is another thing we've had problems with. We just never really have tried. I mean, A.J. Hawk obviously was a, a big swing. I won't say swing and a miss because I don't want to take it there, but it was a big swing that we took. But in general, especially trying to get that second linebacker, it's like, man, we're just not going to put effort into this. We're going to go 
one fourth round guy, and then we're just going to leave it with undrafted free agents and see how that goes. Well, here's how it goes. You get Brad Jones at a 35 overall grade. His run defense grade as a linebacker, 28.9. His tackling as a linebacker, 32.9. I feel like if you're good at stuff as a linebacker, it's like how to tackle people. Like if I want to learn how to tackle, I'm going to go find a linebacker. That's just what I'm going to do, right? I want to talk to Ray Lewis or something, which makes sense, but just make sure when you find a linebacker, his name isn't Brad Jones. See, I talk big, but I, Brad Jones would destroy me. I could just see, that. I, I, like one of those social experiment type videos, you know, those gotcha videos where we pretend we're really good people and we go find bad people and expose them as bad people so that we can feel good about pretending we're good people even though we're bad people. You know the videos I'm talking about? They would listen to this podcast and then Brad Jones would track me down somewhere like coming out of a McDonald's and then he would spear me and my nuggets would go flying and I would just be furious but not do anything because it's Brad Jones and he's bigger than me. Except tell him that I want him to replace my nuggets or I'm calling the police. That's probably how that would go. I don't know. But still, from football standards, he was uh, he was kind of garbage. The other notable, not very good player, Luther Robinson along the defensive line. Offensive side, I'll mention it because it's worth mentioning, even though it's not really worth mentioning. Julius Peppers, again, this is offense. He had one grade on offense and it wasn't great. Other guys that weren't really stepping up, Mr. Lane Taylor, um, Derek Sherrod, Jarrett Boykin, and Matt Flynn, all of which had grades under 50 in the bad category. Getting a little closer now, 2015, the guy that stands out is Nate Palmer once again, a linebacker, because this is just how it goes in Green Bay. You've got one guy that's not great and one guy that's horrible. Fortunately, now we have Blake, who's actually pretty good, but he's next to somebody that is arguably the worst one so far. But I'm sure it'll get better, I'm just saying. Uh, a few other notables, Dimitri Goodson, Bruce Gaston, and Sam Barrington. For those keeping score, Sam Barrington is a linebacker. On the offensive side, once again, um, it's kind of unfair picking on backup quarterbacks, but again, Scott Tolzien. Played three games, 10 snaps, 39.1 overall grade. A couple other standouts, uh, Don Barclay, Alonzo Harris, and Josh Walker. In 2016, one of the worst grades I've seen so far, (laughs) with a 22.4 grade overall. I won't cue the music, but take a minute and take a guess what the, the position is. Mr. Carl Bradford, linebacker, 22.4. 25.9 run defense grade, 30.1 tackling grade, 35.3 coverage grade. Granted, didn't play a lot, but just come on, man. A couple other standouts, Marwin Evans, safety, Josh Hawkins, cornerback, Sam Shields, cornerback, uh, Brian Price along the defensive line, and Dimitri Goodson. The only one with any significant st- snaps was Dimitri Goodson with 182. But you can see the secondary is really starting to get poor. Mike Evans, or like I said, Marwin Evans, safety, Josh Hawkins, Corner, Sam Shields, corner, Dimitri Goodson, corner. And if you keep going, Demarius Randall and Ladarius Gunter are next on that list. So basically the corners are just dragging up the rear here. In 2017, you had two guys under 50 overall. Quinton Rollins with 139 total snaps, so it's not a small sample size. This is back when I was saying Quinton's going to be... I don't know, I might, I might have given up on him at this point. I think it was the year prior that I was all excited he's going to have a bounce back year. After that was Montrevious Adams. It was his rookie year, as we know, did not do very well. Continuing on, Kevin King, because I can't do a podcast without taking some kind of a swipe. But I'm not saying, I'm just reading. We'll quickly move on here. Third worst player, Kevin King. Fourth worst, Josh Jones. And then uh, Ricky Jean, Francois, Kentrell Bryce, Quentin Dial, Marwin Evans. You get the you get the picture here. You already know, man. This is recent history. Um, on offense, it, it it I hate doing this because <laughs> some of these guys I really like and I don't want to accept it. Kind of like, well, I won't mention his name anymore. But you know, you have those guys too. But for me. Like, for for one, B.J. Raji was one that I, I guess I didn't understand that he wasn't that great. I kind of feel like, well, he was hurt and stuff, and he was fine. I don't know. But I like the backup running backs. All these guys that are, like, undrafted free agents, every time they come out, it's like, oh, yeah, the worst. And it's only 14 snaps, two games. But I really like this guy, and I really wanted him to, to be something. And then there were a bunch of injury issues and everything else. But Devontae Mays, 27.9. Now, obviously, we remember Devontae Mays basically played... What did he take? Uh, how many handoffs did he have? Four handoffs. I think he has like three fumbles or something. It's got to be a world record that'll never be broken. 75% fumble rate. I got to double check that. All right, I lied. It was only two fumbles. But still, in week 11, three attempts, negative one yard, two fumbles. Wow. 66% in that game. 
In week 17, he ran the ball once for two yards, and that was the end of his career. That that hurts me, man. I like Devontae. After that, the only other player under 50 was Lance Kendricks at tight end. And then finally, 2018, we've got several players that are not very good. Bringing up the rear, Devon House, 28.8. Eddie Pleasant, 34.2. Oren Burks, 44. Tony Brown, 48.8. Since it was last year, we'll do a couple honorable mentions. Raven Green, Kentrell Bryce, Nick Perry, Corey Toomer, Antonio Morrison, Jermaine Whitehead, and Bashad Breland. These guys are bringing up the back end of that. And again, you know, there's several names here that are seen as players that people like. Oren Burks. I think we understand it wasn't great, but I don't know if we understand how bad it was. Tony Brown. Everybody thinks he was great. I admit, I like Tony Brown. I like the energy. I like the intensity. That doesn't make you a good football player. Raven Green. Everybody loves Raven Green. No idea why. So, anyways, we'll see what happens. But that was uh, that. was that. And then finally, flipping over to the offense, the worst player of anybody. Not surprisingly, and again, we're picking on another quarterback here, but Deshaun Kaiser, three games, 62 snaps, 34.2 overall grade. Uh, a couple guys under 50, Lucas Patrick and Byron Bell. Byron Bell isn't going to surprise anybody. Honorable mentions, Mercedes Lewis, Jamon Moore, Danny Vitale, there's a name right there that everybody loves, Capri Bibbs, J.K. Scott, that's a guy that I like that I want to, I just refuse to admit is not good, and uh, let's see, Jay Kumaro. So, I'm just hitting everybody today, man. I'm stepping on everybody's toes, including my own. But anyways, let's take our final break, and then we'll come back and look at the top 30 players that the Green Bay Packers have ever had, that is, since 2006, and according to PFF. We'll be right back. So this is going to be kind of a speed round, I guess. I don't want to spend a ton of time on this. Um, obviously, there's a lot of repeats, but again, take some time. I was actually surprised a few people didn't actually make the list. Um, guys like Jordy Nelson were never on this list. Again, the cutoff for me was 87, which is ridiculously high, right? Remember, I was going down into the 70s for special teams and stuff. So there have been some really, really high quality players. Jordy Nelson was one of them. Um, remember, 80 is very good. He had 85.8 in 2011, 86 in 2013, 86.9 in 2014, 82.2 in 2016. Pretty much every other grade was in the 70s. So obviously an incredible football player. But just keep that in mind when you're thinking of somebody that's elite that isn't on the list. But also keep in mind how good these 30 are, or not even 30. It's probably going to be 15 or so because there's people like Rodgers on here like 70 times. But um, also keep in mind how good these guys are, especially when they've been on here several times. But the 30th best grade with an 80, actually it's tied. Um, in 2009, Aaron Rodgers, 87.0. In 2014, Josh Sitton, 87.0. The next highest grade, 87.1, was David Bakhtiari in 2017. And that same year was the um, 27th best grade, which is Kenny Clark in 2017. 87.8 is uh, 2018 Devontae Adams. Now let that sink in for a minute. What, what did I just say about Jordy Nelson? He's been elite basically his entire year. And I, I know technically not elite, which is 90. He's not really there. But just think how good he's been. And we all understand and acknowledge how good he's been. Devontae Adams in 2018 was better than the best year that um, that Jordy ever had. That's, that's huge, man. That, that Just how good he really was. That's really crazy, and that's really awesome that he's on this team. 2008, actually there's uh, two guys right next to each other, both of them 2008, and both of them offensive linemen, Darren College and Scott Wells, 87.9 and 88. There's a lot of really good offensive linemen the Packers have had over the years. Um, Several of them were, you know, in different groups in different time periods. We're in one of those time periods now, I think, Back when we had, you know, Sitton and Lang was another just elite offensive line. But there's been a couple in that Darren College, Scott Wells era. Also back in the 90s, some of the guys that uh, blocked for Brett Favre were just incredible. Um, but anyways, 2008 was a good year. Um, making his second appearance on this list already, 2018, David Bakhtiari, 88.3. Also keep that in the back of your mind. We all understand who, how good Bakhtiari is. We all understand that he was the number one tackle in the entire NFL at 88.3. We've got several, uh, I believe, we got offense, yeah, several offensive linemen still higher on this list. Again, just to put in context how good some of these guys really are and were. In 2006, we're going way back. Actually, 2006 has the next two guys at 88.4 and 88.7, Nick Collins and Charles Woodson. 
talk about a great secondary in 2006. I think that was back in like the Al Harris days. I'm not sure if he was there at that time, but I just remember that era being just fantastic, jumping routes, getting all those picks and pick sixes. It was scary. I, I, I want that again so bad, man. I want it. And I feel like we could, I'm not saying this year necessarily, but we've got the pieces to where we could have like one or two or three of those kinds of guys where maybe we have that that one or two year window where it's just, you just don't throw on the Packers because they're just going crazy. I hope we get that again. That'd be pretty awesome. And it, again, it's hard because we're talking, again, think how good we're, we're talking about here. 88.4, 88.7, two nearly elite defensive backs on that squad. Another defensive back is next on the list, Casey Hayward in 2014. We kind of already talked about him. He was on that 2014 team. Um, so fantastic defensive back. We don't have very many defensive backs on this list. 2013, this one's a bit of a shocker. But again, and I I, I, I didn't really know that he was going to be on this list. This is not 2014. But I had mentioned how much I really appreciate this guy and really thought he was a great uh, player. Eddie Lacy, 88.9 overall grade. He's a, he, I mean, he, he was a good running back. You just, you really cannot debate that. He just was. He had his issues. He had depression issues. He had weight issues. He had injury issues. He had, you know, kind of got off to a slow start a lot. But when, I mean, when he was going, he, I, you know, I don't want to say I would take him over anybody because there's some great running backs, but he was, he was up there. I don't think he ever got the credit. And that was one of the most disappointing moments um, as far as being a Packer fan, is when Eddie Lacy left and pa- a lot of Packer fans were jumping on the good, get good riddance, he's no good, that kind of bandwagon. It's like, why are you doing that? And he's struggling, I get it, but don't treat him like that. That's ridiculous. In 2010, at 89.1, was Mr. Desmond Bishop. Desmond Bishop is all over the place because I think I mentioned his name a couple times, once or twice on the lowest uh, list. But I also mentioned his name. He's not on this list as a top 30, but I think he was uh, in that 2014 team a really good player as well. So 2010, 89.1. I think 2014 he was pretty solid, but he's also been one of the lowest contributors also. So, you know, he had his moments. Another 2006 guy, solid defense, Mr. Cullen Jenkins. That was one of the guys I talked about in 2014 as having a low grade. I got called out about that by a friend of mine because my son has the same name. Kind of a how dare you situation, but Colin Jenkins was the man in in his day. 2014 apparently was not his day, but 2006 he was the man. 89.7, basically elite in that year. The next is actually an exact tie at 89.7, and it's the exact same player making his second and third appearance on this list. Aaron Rodgers in 2012 and Aaron Rodgers in 2018. Again, 2018 Aaron Rodgers, according to PFF, and make your own assertions. I know there were some issues like, why didn't he hit the check down? What's going on with this, that, or the other? Pro Football Focus is looking at it. They weren't big big fans of you know certain offensive linemen, wide receivers, tight ends. They were not putting the blame on Rodgers. This, according to them, was one of not only Aaron Rodgers' best performances, right? better than 2012, uh, better than, what was it, 2009? And Rodgers is going to be on here several more times. But still, I mean, this was his, I I believe, fourth best. I'm giving away some of what's going on here. But his fourth best ever performance in his career, as bad as this offense was. Again, take it for what you want. But if we're going to put our trust in in pro football focus to even any degree whatsoever, the way we need to look at this is Aaron Rodgers is still one of the best in the NFL, by far. He's still an elite quarterback. Even last year, he was. The offense was just broken all around him. Then again, we get another offensive lineman. This time in 2008, so that same 2008 team. So Darren College, Scott Wells at 87, 9, and 88. Now we get Jason Spitz, 89.1. That's three 2008 offensive linemen um, on this top 30 list. That's really incredible. In 2010, we get um, maybe one of the best, if not the best, and certainly the most underrated offensive lineman that we've ever had. Josh Sitton, 90.1, our first truly elite player on this list. 2010 Josh Sitton, man, it just, it just, Josh Sitton was what Bakhtiari is now. Um, You know, maybe, I think maybe part of the reason Sitton's grade is going to be higher is because he's going up against interior guys, whereas Bakhtiari is going up against the best, best pass rushers in the NFL. So we can debate that however you want, but Josh Sitton was indisputably the best guard in football for several years, similar to what Bakhtiari is. I miss that man like nothing else. And he's still playing at a high level, which is why I wanted him to come back. But I understand he's old and it's going to fall apart very soon. In 2012, with a 90.2 overall grade, Mr. Sam Shields, another guy that we all know, you know, didn't always work out the way that we had hoped it to, but he was he was and is a very, very good football player. 2015, with a 90.3 overall grade, Mr. Mike Daniels. 
It's his only appearance on this list. He's had several good years, but uh, Mike Daniels in 2015 was just un- unstoppable. Again, bear in mind, 13... Actually, you know what? I lied because the top mark... So it's actually only 29 players. I forgot I had the header up there at the top in the first you know row. But 12 players since 2006, only 12 have had elite grades. Mike Daniels in 2015, 10th best overall player ever since 2006. <laughs> I really do hope they start going back historically and, and start backfilling some of these maybe in the offseason because I think that'd be really cool to be able to go back. And I know it's going to be kind of hard to grade older and older with the changing this, that, or the other. Whatever. It would still be really cool to be able to look at. I'm sure there would be a lot of players that were uncovered that are just kind of passed over, not talked about nearly as much because they're from the 70s and nobody really knows aside from the really big names, but whatever. 2018, following right in Mike Daniels' uh, uh, shoe steps, Footprints, that's what I'm going for. 90.5, almost the exact same grade as Mike Daniels in 2015, but it's the 2018 version of Kenny Clark, just picking up right where Mike Daniels left off. Fantastic football player, um, best defensive lineman on this list, and as young as he is, it's just extremely exciting what his upside is. In uh, 2013, making his second appearance is once again Josh Sitton, this time a 90.7. Again, this is 2013, so two years He had an elite grade as a left guard for the Green Bay Packers. The seventh highest grade, and basically this is, we've got uh, six more and four of them, I'm sorry, seven more and four of them are Aaron Rodgers, which again, bear in mind what that means. They don't, they don't, it's not going to be slanted toward Aaron Rodgers because he's a quarterback. I can show you lots of quarterbacks who have horrible grades, including Aaron Rodgers in 2009, who was graded as the worst. It's not because he's a quarterback. It's because he's that good. When I talk about Jordy Nelson and how good he was, Mike Daniels, Kenny Clark, Josh Sitton, Cullen Jenkins, uh, Charles Woodson, all these, Aaron Rodgers is better. But in 2016, the 2016 version of Aaron Rodgers, 91.4. In 2012, Mr. Casey Hayward coming in at 91.5. Another guy that just absolutely out of his mind for a very, very limited... He's one of those guys that if he had had that you know 2012-ish type season for five, six, seven years or whatever, he would be just, you know, we're talking Pro Bowl, Hall of Fame, all that, everything. But similar to Sam Shields, it just didn't work out as consistently and for as long as you would hope. In 2015, T.J. Lang. Now, I've I've always liked T.J. Lang, and I knew he was a very good right guard, and I would never say that he was better than Josh Sitton over the course of his career. But we're talking about the, let's see, fifth the best ever ever offensive or defensive grade ever for the Green Bay Packers TJ Lang in 2015 better than any year Josh Sitton David Bakhtiari Corey Lindsley have ever had ever that's really impressive and then in 2009 the fourth best grade and the only or the last non-Aaron Rodgers grade yes that's right the top three grades are all Aaron Rodgers the guy's a freak Charles Woodson in 2009 with a 91.7 overall grade Charles Woodson obviously not very debatable as far as how good he is and has been in his career. But in 2009, the guy was just lights out. So finally, the last three grades. And again, this just goes to show how incredible he is. You know, you just just look at what we've talked about over the years. Sitton, Shields, Clark, not one of them can touch Aaron Rodgers in terms of frequency, consistency, and level of play. That highest non-Rodgers grade was Charles Woodson in 2009 at 91.7. In 2010, 91.9 Aaron Rodgers. Then it jumps from 91.9 to 93, which is ridiculous and not super surprising. It's the 2011 version of Aaron Rodgers, which was just annihilate everybody. And then had 93.4, the greatest performance since 2006 for any Green Bay Packer, was Aaron Rodgers in 2014, the year in which I said that was the greatest year. And I, I kind of want to go watch Game Pass and go look at that because I don't remember. Like, I remember 2010, and I remember 2011. 2014 doesn't really stick out in my mind for any reason whatsoever. So I'm going to have to go back and watch that because apparently, and basically it's like tied with 2011, and we remember how good, apparently Aaron Rodgers was on that level. But the highest graded Packers performances, the three highest ever, 2010 Rodgers, 2011 Rodgers, 2014 Rodgers. So it's it's pretty cool, man. This is a cool list. It's cool to go back and look at some of these guys. Some guys that just kind of flashed in for a minute like Bishop and Eddie Lacy and, you know, College and Wells. And then some other just legends, you know, David Bakhtiari. And actually I lied about Sitton. He was on here three times. I forgot about his 2014 um, edition here. 
but, you know, Sitton. Uh, Woodson was only on the list once, but, you know, legend. So, anyways, I really thought it was pretty cool. You folks have yourselves a fantastic rest of your Saturday. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.